Thanks so much. It's an honor to be here amongst uh, the highest research in the world in longevity, and uh, we're just thrilled. Thanks to our sponsors for throwing this conference. It's very important. I'm the, as mentioned, I'm the head of corporate development, not the chief science officer, so I might uh, speed through some of the data. If, if I do that, either I don't understand it or we just don't have time. I'm going to go if we just don't have time. Um, Ocean Biotechnologies is, um, it was a science experiment about uh, four years ago that has turned into a preclinical company very quickly. Uh, we're thrilled to have investors in the room who have helped us on that. Uh, thank you, Sens. Thank you, uh, groups and sponsors who have done that for us. We have a primary focus is killing. You've heard a lot about senescent cells. We're going to be talking a lot about senescent cells today. We have uh, we, we found that targeting senescent cells, specifically two types, uh, really helps and it abates uh, quite a few age-related diseases, including cancer, which is our first oncology spin-out, which we'll talk about and show you some data on. So you've heard a lot about senescent cells, uh, and what are they exactly? Well, we think they're the chief, one of the chief causes of age and age-related diseases. In fact, um, they could be almost described as zombie cells in the body. Most cells know that they, if, when they have damage, if they're healthy, that they create an apoptotic pathway to, to kill themselves. Um, the problem with senescent cells is that that gene gets stuck, and they don't know how to. They forget how to literally die and they take up space. And it might be thought that these cells are responsible for maybe over 180 age-related diseases, including sarcopenia, um, some of the things you heard about tonight, heart-related disease, COPD, and of course cancer. So just a brief, what is a senescent cell? On the left-hand side, you see a healthy young cell. It's got low protein oxidation. It, it functions. Its nucleus is fine. And what happens when the cell becomes damaged, the DNA of the cell becomes damaged, it exhibits all sorts of lipofusion. Uh, it secretes unhealthy and, and toxic types of, uh, of inflammatory DNA, as, as, as some mentioned earlier. And if you look on the left-hand side, or the right-hand side, you'll see as well that uh, a normal cell has a very... Uh, thin lines, and we've stained the one on the right with beta-galactic cyanide staining, so you can see there's definitely inflammation. And it's, the theory is that these cells take up room, and when they take up room, they, they kind of take the place of the healthy stem cells, and that's what causes a lot of these age-related diseases. Um, a lot of work was done by the Mayo Clinic and Judy Campisi's uh, lab as well. Um, what you're seeing now are two genetically engineered mice. Uh, this study was done, I think, about 2008, several years ago. These mice... Uh, uh, we're basically the same age, uh, same genetics, same diet, same lifestyle. In fact, for all intents and purposes, same mouse, just like brothers, litter mates. Um, the suicide promoter gene of P16 was removed from one of the mice, and I, I bet you, you can guess which mice, mouse it was. But what we saw was a significant improvement in lifespan and health span of the mouse. These are the, remember, these are the same age mice. They, they've had the same diet. The one on the left just is a normal control mouse, this aged normally. The one on the right was running circles around it. Uh, lived 25% longer, had 50% less cancer. Uh, we also noticed that its cataracts, frailty, loss of hair uh, were, also, um, were also ablated. So this got us thinking, wow, this is really interesting technology if you are a mouse, but what, if you, what else could we do with it and how could we make this work on a, on a larger scale? What's also interesting is uh, Peter de Keyser's work. Uh, this is actually the same mouse you're seeing, an aged mouse before. We actually, I think they, they actually treated it with chemotherapy, a, a great way to create senescence in a mouse and, and get hair loss. What they found by pulling the P16 out is not only did it, did it live longer, it actually showed regenerative properties. So this gave us a lot of interesting thoughts on how, what we could do next with this, with, this, with this technology, if we could figure out how to get it through the body. So currently there are quite a few ways to get into the body. Um, you're seeing small molecules is a very big one, like uh, CAR-T therapies, immunotherapies are, are, are very big. Uh, and then we think the future of cancer treatment and, and uh, the future of a lot of treatments going forward might be at the cellular level, the plasma technology, what we call sensolytic, because we're sensing what the cell is thinking. Uh, these are the two main paths to senolytic drugs. Um, Right now, the way we treat uh, cancers specifically, let's say, is, is an age-related disease. It's kind of a blunt instrument trying to go for a small area. As it was alluded to earlier, cancer is constantly moving through the body, and we can see that through, tele through microscopes that we have now. We can actually track the cancers as they go, and they form, and the immune system takes them out. So right now we use radiation, which kind of kills everything. It's an indiscriminate attack. We can use chemotherapy, which as if anyone's had uh, friends or family that have gone through chemo, it is not a pleasant experience. In fact, we think it reduces your health span and lifespan potentially because it's creating so much senescence, damage good, good and bad. CAR T is a more concentrated therapy, but they do have immunoresponses. They've got a bit of a ways to go, but they're very important for the future of medicine. And again, we, we look at activated pathways now in the cell to target those specific what the cell is thinking. So here's how it works. 
Uh, we basically have a, a patented technology on, we like I mentioned earlier, P16 and P53. We've, we decided to show and target those specific plasmas because they seem to be exhibited in most age-related diseases. What we do is create a essentially DNA plasmid which encodes a suicide gene, a caspase 9 promoter that active, is active in the target. You can almost think of them as logic gates, like you're programming a computer, they're if, for, and. So they only activate if the cell is exhibiting signs of P16, P53, and showing signs that it's actually uh, dead. It knows that it's dead, but it just can't figure out how to apoptose, how to kill itself. Uh, we have a library of these plasmids that we've built, and uh, we've actually, th these are the actual codes that we use to actually get into the cell and create the apoptosis. Now, how do we get into the cell? Well, we use our new fusogenic technology. It's a lipid nanoparticle. Now, lipid nanoparticles, if you're familiar with them, had a, a little bit of bad press. They were killing people. They had a lot of toxicity um, because they were positively charged and negatively charged. Uh, we're fortunate to have, as our ch chief science officer, the head of Entos, which owns the, uh, the fusogenic platform that we use. And he's also our, yeah, our chief science officer for ocean and ocean oncology. And what it is is essentially a neutrally charged lipid nanoparticle protein where we can put in our coding into that code into, the, uh, into the, the delivery platform. The delivery then goes into the cell, but instead of blasting through, it's like punching someone in the face and giving them a lollipop. We're not doing that anymore. We're going on top of the cell, and we're lightly opening up the cell, and we're distributing our plasmids. Um, we've tested this on mice, to, uh, which I'll show you the data on shortly, and we have seen no real toxicity at all, no CARPA, no other immunogenitive responses that we've seen. We've also uh, done experiments in uh, African green monkeys, so uh, we've had non-human primate toxicology, uh, where we gave uh, some of the, the cohort 10 times the highest human dose we would ever give a human. All of them survived with what we could see as no toxicology. In fact. We're in the process of actually uh, taking a look at those monkeys now the study has ended, and we think there actually may be regenerative properties as a result. So um, this goes into a little bit more of how it works. So the, once we deliver this plasmid, once it's into the cell cytoplasm, what happens next is the iCaspase 9 creates the uh, caspase cascade. So essentially, we uh, create apoptosis in that cell. Um, this, uh, we, we typically, this is an old version, so what you're seeing is the AP2187 actually is a dimerizer that we use. Um, we, we've found that we put it, we wanted to get the, every, is get as many cells as possible indiscriminately in with our delivery platform with, with, with our, uh, plasmid, and then we activate it with a dimerizer. And that instantly, what we found, created, uh, apoptosis in, in all the cells almost immediately. So... We started running our own experiments on 16, age, 16 mice, 80 weeks old. Um, we had a control dose of 5 milligrams and 10 milligrams. We wanted to see how this worked. Uh, we basically uh, aged mice with a significant senescent cell burden. This one was P16 when we first started. We injected our lipid nanoparticles that we, we showed you along with our P16 plasmid on early version. Then we waited uh, a little bit of time, and then we injected them with the dimerizer. And then we saw a significant redu reduction in the SASP. And here's the results. So um, our first results show the con on the black line is the control. So we basically gave them a, you know, a neutral uh, LMP with nothing in it. Then we did a low dose and a high dose. So what's interesting to note is in the seminal vesicles, we saw significant uh, decreases in senescence specifically. What you're seeing is a reduction of senescence and senescent cells extracting mice. And in, in, in guinal fat, we saw like it wasn't even noticeable. We couldn't see any senescence left in the high dose. Uh, lung, it had uh, quite a bit of effect as well, um, significant margins in, the, in there. And this showed that we were able to clear senescent cells without damaging the mice, and they all lived through the experiment and seemed to show signs of, of, of no senescence. Here's what it looks like under the microscope. We stained the senescent cells with beta galactic cyanides again, so you could see where they are. In the control, um, the, mice, the mouse, aged mouse has typical aged cell senescence. In the low dose, not a lot of uh, effect, but in the high dose, uh, we saw significant clearing of senescent cells for kidneys. And then in the seminal vesicles, you can notice it's just an interesting way that the senescence takes place. And I'm wondering if there, the people that talked about germ um, uh, things earlier, if there's any relation, it'd be interesting to figure that out. But bottom line is at the end of the high dose, we had significant decrease in the senescent cells. Now, uh, this is uh, an ongoing study which we thought we'd have wrapped up before we got here, and this is, uh, this is just being released in public to you. We are in the process of publishing a lot of this information. What you're seeing is, is sort of a, an interesting precedent. Um, we've decided to do a longevity study on mice, uh, and we treated 
uh, a control group, a P16 only, a P53 only, and then a double treatment, P16 and P53. What I can report to you that over, I think, 920, 930 days later, uh, I think we're, this, this is actually outdated a little bit. We've had another death in the control mouse, but we, until literally just a few days ago, had no deaths in the uh, P53 and P16. Uh, we had just a few deaths in the P53 and a few deaths in the P16 only. Um, so this is going to be interesting data, and w when it's done, we'll, we'll let you know. It could be a while, but this, this study will end when the last mouse dies. So we're pla placing bets in Vegas now if you'd like to participate. <laughs> um, uh, so this, uh, this demonstrates our LMP safety. So what we know from our studies in mouse is not only is it helpful long longevity-wise, but uh, we don't think that it, there's any toxic uh, abilities with it. So. Um, this is an example of some of the uh, various LNPs that were out in the market, some that were taken out uh, in their phase one because they were causing too much toxicity, uh, destroying too many cells. Um, Ocean has a significant, and this is an old version, we, th we just reformulated an, a non-dimerizer version that we think can do, actually we gave it 10 times a dose, we think we can give 60 times a dose now without any, um, any side effects at all. And so we're actually in our preclinical toxicology right now just uh, uh, looking at uh, our formulations uh, and about to enter GLP tox. So, um, like I said, no antibodies, responses and immune concepts in our mice. We've, we've had uh, no vaccination against LMPs. They don't seem to reduce the efficacy at all. Our, no CARPA issues that we've seen in any of the mice that we've studied, including in the high doses or low doses. And uh, we initiated that, um, that non-human primate study, like we said, and we're just collecting tissue data as well. We've, the monkeys, all the monkeys survived the study with no toxicology effects. Now we're gonna see if we actually had the tissue, eventually they kill the animals, unfortunately, when the study ends. And now we have the plasma and the tissue, and we're gonna identify if we've actually helped uh, in, in any of those tissue areas. So from a commercialization strategy, because it is important that we're not just a science experiment anymore, we decided once we got the data back from uh, on December 24th, I believe it was last year, we decided we, we better move quickly because we've got some data that we're about to show you that's pretty, pretty amazing. So we structured the company as a, as a parent subsidiary model. And the parent owns all the patents and, and technology at the top because there's multiple applications we can go after. Right now, our, like I mentioned, uh, our first joint venture is in oncology because we have a lot of amazing data there. Um, but we also are currently in a cosmetic <laughs> group right now, understanding skin treatments for wrinkles and aging that's actually a therapy, as well as ocular degeneration. We have uh, a group that has an MTA with us that's looking into using our uh, licensing platform. So we're really designed to be a licensing platform strategy uh, going forward. Um, and Oncocenix Ocean's bio is, is a first and it's also owned by Entos, which is the lipid nanoparticle. So it's a joint venture with, between our two companies. So now I'm gonna talk about our oncology data. We've actually just rebranded the company. It was Ocean Oncology, now it's Oncocenex. And it would be, it'll, it'll be first, we think, in man in the, by 2019. So um, what you're seeing here, our uh, chief science officer is the head of prostate cancer research at the University of Alberta, Canada. So, uh, and, and we had some, um, some donors uh, that actually had prostate cancer and asked us, hey, maybe we could test this. And I said, yeah, well, we should probably test it for obvious reasons. We've got the head of prostate cancer research. So we injected a mice with a pretty significant cancer tumor, you can see. Imagine having a, a big tumor on your back, almost the size of your whole lower back. Um, we, we started um, a single dose of our LMP and a single dimerizer hit, and we were astonished. Within 24 hours, the, the the, the tumor itself had just dropped in half. And then within 48 hours, we saw a 90-fold reduction in the tumor completely. The mouse continued to live. You can see it was two weeks later. It started showing regenerative properties. Its hair was growing back. It seemed fine. It was eating. Um, there was a little bit of, of tumor uh, or biofeed left, but we couldn't find any cancer in it. We think it's just the body absorbed the, uh, the material so quickly that it might have left some, some things in the body uh, in, in there. But we um, were pretty excited by this data, so we said, well, we should probably test others. So we started a, a 4NSG mice bearing. Uh, we did the PC3 again. We wanted to test multiple doses of this LMP to see if we could you know, poison them, if, if, if there's any toxicology issues in the mouse. And we, and we pretty much got the same results. Um, no issues in toxicology. All the mice pretty much survived the entire, the entire study. So then we decided to up the dosage even more. And this is a demonstration of how we escalated the dosage over time. We did the LMPs, we up the dosage to a significant margin. And it seems to be the more we put in, the better the mouse did in terms of its ability to fight off these, these uh, diseases. So 
Um, on the right just explains exactly what we did uh, to the animals. And again, no, no, dose toler no dose response issues at all from the mice. Also, we saw from a longevity perspective, while we were testing cancer, we did see that the ones treated with the higher dosages did tend to live longer as a total in their cohort. And that's what this on the right-hand side is, is showing. This is a single dose as well. We just decided to say, would there be a longevity issue as well as treating cancer? And it turns out the answer was yes. We also wanted to fo focus on uh, human uh, metastases in cancers because that uh, is something that if we could target would be really interesting. So we've demonstrated pr profound reduction in, uh, in cancer metastases as well, in prostate cancer, but can we do metastases? We know that killing senescent cells uh, generally inhibits metastases and repairs chemotherapy and radiation. And so this is just demonstrating that we were able to actually arrest metastases and keep it at bay for uh, as long as we kept dosing in, in the injections in, in this prostate cancer mouse. So in summary on this, we can reliably induce tumor cells. We take apoptose in solid tumors without seeming to have any side effects for the mouse. Uh, the treatment can also induce additional immunogenic cell deaths. So cytokines and antigens can be added to increase immune system targeting. So we could actually go into these cells and turn the lights back on for the immune system. We, we did that once and it worked out very well. Um, using viral antigens known as uh, patient's immune system could further this, this, this process. Um, and so we, we think we can also pair this treatment with multiple other cancer treatments. And this could be also a, um, a, a companion diagnostic as well as a treatment for chemotherapy for people that have had uh, senescence burden based on their, ca their current cancer treatments. Um, I'll skip over, this is just a melanoma model we did, but I think it's easier to see in this picture. Uh, basically, we stripped a mouse of its, uh, um, we took an immunogenic mouse and put a uh, very aggressive metastasis cancer inside of its lung. And it basically, so if you had this cancer, you'd, you probably would be dead before you got to the doctor's office the next day. It doubled every 10 hours. Um, so on the left-hand side, on the lower left, you can see that the mouse is, it, it just continuing to grow and, and become huge. On the right-hand side, we treated it with one of our uh, just P53 injections, and we saw a 20-fold reduction in, in, the, uh, in the tumor. It didn't go away, but coupled with an immunotherapy, we were able to ablate and get these uh, out. So it's, what this shows us is that there could be, multi, even with the most aggressive cancer treatments, we may be able to be first line of defense coupled with other therapies. Um, so this is just a summary of the data. Uh, we have um, relatively low P53 activation. Mice treated with tumors uh, reached uh, 400 um, cubed um, millimeters, and this is more science that I will skip over. <laughs> but, and go to the business case for us. Um, I'll skip over this as well, but as, as it was alluded to early, a lot of pharmaceutical companies about 10 years ago seemed to nuke a lot of their R&D in favor of finding discovery-based platforms or discovery-based companies in which they could purchase. Um, also, in addition to that, because a lot of their, their big patent drugs are coming off patents going to generics, so companies are losing billions of dollars a year uh, where they were making and they're having to replace that pipeline. We believe our company's pretty well positioned to take advantage of that. That. This gives you sort of an example of the deals that were done, and, and this is dated information. I'll have to get the new stuff in 2016. 67% um, of the licensed deals were for discovery or preclinical in 2016 at that time. Um, discovery average upfront payments were about $35 million if they were to acquire the asset, or phase one was around $50 million, $49 million. And the total values of deals seem to be increasing. Uh, in 2017, I noticed that there was quite a few biopharma deals. You probably heard a lot of them in the news. Double deals like with Juno being acquired by Celgene for I think it was $9.6 billion after four years of you know, work. Um, things like that are happening on a more frequent basis, especially in cancer. So. Uh, again, this is outdated information. What I highlighted here were discovery phase assets. So we're preclinical, so we're ahead of discovery right now. We're looking at, to go into clinic by next year. But this gives you an example of some of the upfront payments. And now keep in mind, this was CAR T, a lot of these were CAR T therapies back in uh, 2016. I believe you know, in 2014, there weren't that many, from what I could read, acquisitions in CAR T because it was a two new technology and everyone was trying to get into it. I believe sensolytic treatments for cancer is the next generation. And it's probably where CAR T was in 2014 now. So maybe we're about two years away with companies like Unity and others trying to go after uh, drugs that are focused on aging. I think this is the next big, the next big play. And uh, speaking of Unity, they, I believe, have a 600 or more million dollar valuation. Uh, we wish them well. Uh, we, we hope they do well. They're the first to market in the public space. Um, but all these others are doing very well. We heard about um, BioAge and Silica. So we, we don't know what our valuation is at this point. We are about to go into clinic, and we're mission-driven and focused. So um, we're open to suggestions. Uh, but at this point, we will be raising a, a small bit of capital uh, to move ourselves forward. 
This is a little bit about the team. It all started with the two on the left, uh, Gary Hudson and Matthew Schultz. Uh, Gary is now our executive chairman. Matt's our full-time CEO. They were at a conference and they thought we could do this. This is where it was a science experiment. Now it's a real full-fledged company. Dr. John Lewis, who I mentioned, runs the University of Alberta, Canada, uh, cancer research for prostate cancer. Myself, Kevin Perot is at the Buck Institute uh, working on biomarkers. And Eric Garcia has worked with Matt for, oh gosh, eight, 10 years as his uh, CFO, basically working CFO in, in his other companies. So thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to listen to us.